Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I start, actually, I should mention this is the last uh, shear until after the summer break. So um, I'm taking off after Tishbov for, for a few weeks, um, after which we will carry on. Um, so I apologize, everyone will have to carry on with the uh, Torah Shabal pair by themselves uh, for a few weeks. Um, I've put everyone on mute as usual, but please, uh, please do feel free to unmute yourselves if, uh, if you wish to say anything. So uh, we were looking at the, uh, the differing views about uh, the parameters of Torah Shabal pair. In previous weeks, we discussed uh, why we believe in Torah Shabal pair, the indications for the concept from, um, from the Torah Shabal from, from the written Torah itself. Um, a little bit about the chain of transmission and, and what that looked like. Uh, in a sense, very classic stuff, really, uh, dealt with already by the Gaonim and the Kuzari. We, last week, we began discussing, though, what actually do we mean by Torah Shabal Peh? What are the parameters of uh, Torah Shabal Peh? And I, uh, it, just in order to contextualize the discussion, I presented a view of Rav, uh, Rav Shimshon Afel Hirsch, Samson Afel Hirsch, uh, which is useful in... in delineating one end of the spectrum of a, a stance one could take. Um, I, I dealt with it ahistorically and others. I really should have gone back to Chazal and uh, the Rishonim, the Gaonim and the Rishonim to deal with the issue. But it was useful just to start with Rahash because he lays out uh, one formulation, which is at one end or near the end of one spectrum, in which he basically says uh, everything found in Torah Shabal Peh um, was part of an oral Masura. We shouldn't really expect when we look in Torah Shabal to be able to derive from that all the concepts of Torah Shabal Peh. Um, it's a bit like students' notes of a, uh, a shir or a lecture that one hears. Um, if one knows the shir, one knows the lecture, one can look at the notes and see how they convey the information. But there's no way to backwards engineer the topic and uh, derive from the notes everything that was uh, said. So um, Torah Shabal Peh is a huge amount of data transmitted and uh, it's not that when, when Chazal are driving and drawing out droshas and the like, we shouldn't think they are um, creating, in some sense, new Torah Shabal Peh. They're merely linking their oral tradition back to, um, to what, was originally, uh, what was originally said um, in, the in the Nasurah, in the tradition. And the notes, the Torah Shabal it's true, one can't derive these halachas from there, one can simply um, see how they are indicated in these notes. So this is uh, one position. I, I mentioned very briefly, I'm, I'm not going to go into it now, there is a view of the Bahag, um, the Bal Halachas Gadolus. This is a, a figure from the era of the Goonim, very, very important uh, halachic I mean, uh, classic work, who um, counts amongst the 613 mitzvahs, um, even mitzvahs drabonon. So he is of the view that even mitzvahs, which we know um, are drawn from later on in history, um, let's say Neus Hanukkah, for example, so we know that's a historical event that came uh, much later in history, nonetheless are also part of the Steve tradition, almost as if the oral Torah says, when this and this event occurs, then this halacha should click in. So this is a, a very extreme formulation of the concept of Torah Shabal Peh, um, even broader. And I, I labeled this sort of stance the maximalist position. Um, we're going to look at, uh, in this year, at um, a series of makuras of sources from Chazal. And I'm going to argue that when we look at Chazal, there definitely are sources that could be learned and sound a little bit akin to a Samson Raphael Hirsch's position. There are also sources that sound very different um, and seem to indicate a, a far more minimalistic perspective on Torah Shabal Peh. Um, and then we will see that this is in fact a machlokas rishonim, and that uh, we find classic sources along the spectrum. And I'll look at a couple of these classic sources, including, of course, the Rambam's uh, view on the on the matter. But first, we'll just remind ourselves of the terminology I'm using and the trade-off. The maximalist end of the spectrum veers towards arguing that more and more, uh, a larger and larger extent of what we call Torah Shabal Peh, the Gemara, the Mishnah, the Medrash, all the ideas that we find in Torah Shabal Peh. Um, all of these are part of the oral tradition handed down. The minimalist position says, no, there's a few things in that oral tradition, things perhaps that are labeled halach and emotion with Sinai. Um, that makes up maybe uh, 5, 10, 15 percent of the Gemara. And a large part of the Gemara is um, exactly what it looks like. It's deriving new halachas using svara, using reasoning, using uh, 
drushes, the, the hermeneutical principles, the yud gimel midas shatoy in the drushes for him, with which we are familiar, basically drawn out through a careful reading in Chazal's unique style of the written Torah of Torah Shabbat. So these are the two ends of the spectrum. No one is going to argue for zero content to Torah Shabbat to claim it's all derived from drushes. We saw that's impossible if one understands what Torah Shabbat is. Um, and we saw the various sources that indicate there has to have been an oral component. No one is going to argue that Chazal, well, almost no one is going to argue that Chazal didn't innovate anything. I mean, clearly, Drabonons are an example of things which Chazal innovated. However, somewhere in between uh, is, is a range of opinions about what's included in Torah Shabbat Peh and how far we, uh, we extend it, how far we stretch it. Now, if you choose a maximalist position, the advantage you get is that the whole of Torah Shabbat Peh has the weight of that which was handed down from Sinai. Um, the disadvantage is that when you find machlokas, when you find arguments, you have to accept that this is due to a deterioration, a loss of information that was in Torah Shabbat Peh, that was in the oral tradition. Every time you find machlokas, something's gone terribly wrong. Something's been lost in the tradition. If you take the minimalistic stance, then machlokas is, is fantastic. We can embrace arguments. Machlokas is, is human um, reason, not any old human, chazal, with, with their full um, authority and the depth of insight and breadth of knowledge and spiritual sensitivity and awareness. Nonetheless, it's Chazal somehow uh, understanding Torah and generating halacha. And uh, that's what Samach is. It's not a loss of Masorah. And the small amount of Torah Shabbat Peh, the small amount of genuine tradition which dates back to Moshe, over that we don't find Samach So there's a trade-off in the two models between the two. You, you can't have your cake and eat it. If you want to adopt a larger picture of Torah Shabbat Peh, the price one has to pay is a greater acceptance of a greater deterioration due to machlokas, due to arguments, due to loss of tradition over the, uh, over the generations. So this is, I think, a, a fair summary of what we discussed last time. Um, a couple, uh, one person, I think, or maybe even two people off group, um, asked me a little bit about how this links to Agada, to Medrashim. Now, um, how to learn Medrash, in other words, not Halacha, but Medrash, um, the stories the Medrashim tell us, um, many of which are not found in the Torah at all, or are only found with very light indication. And some of the stories are, 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 are miraculous or bizarre or a little strange in how one reads them. Um, to what degree is this also a conversation about Medrash and not, also, or not only a conversation about Halakha? Um, there's three or four points to make about that. The first thing is, in a sense, it's the same Achlokas. In the same way as one would argue over the source of halachas, um, when we learn a detail in Hilchas Shabbos, was this detail handed down to Moshe Sinai, or was this derived by the strangers, by the, by the Chazal, by the sages? There will be exactly the same achlokas in Medrash. Many of these Medrashim, are they part of some sort of oral tradition, or are they ideas which were generated by Chazal using their insight and their ability to read Torah Shabbat in the way that we've been taught through the principles of of the Yud Gimel Midas. And I already mentioned last week, the Yud Gimel Midas are not necessarily intuitive uh, literary devices. They may be uh, based upon a different assumption about how the text works, a bit like um, computer programming. You can't read a computer program as poetry. You have to understand what the nature of the text is before you, uh, before you interpret it. So Medrash has in principle the same machlokas as there is in Halacha. Um, but then there's two other things that need to be said about Medrash. And uh, these I'm not going to go into now because these are already a separate share. Number one, it's possible that Medrash also includes traditions that predate Matan Torah. So, for example, when we have a story about um, Avram of Yinu and Or Kastim being thrown into the fiery furnace, um, it's possible this is a tradition from Sinai. In other words, it's identical to, let's say, Samson Raphael Hirsch's view of general Torah Shaval Peh. Um, it's possible it's derived from a text, because after all, when we learn the Torah of Ram being thrown into the fiery furnace, is not mentioned. What is mentioned is that Hashem says, I rescued you from Ur custom. Now, Ur custom can be translated as Ur of the custom, of the, of the, the nation, the charities, the nation called the custom. It's referring then to a city that we know from archaeological records, we know historically existed, Ur. Or it could be translated as Ur, the fiery furnace of the custom. In which case, this would be a... Uh, oral tradition that, uh, um, th that's derived or indicated only by the hint in the Pasuk. 
So where does this story come from? Well, indeed, the story is about things that happened to Moshe before he was chosen by Hashem in the, in the incident of the burning bush. There's these more or less 80 missing years of Moshe's life. We meet him at 80 at the burning bush. We meet him as a young man in Egypt confronting the Egyptian taskmasters. We don't really know that much about what happened in between when he ran away to Midian. And again, there's extensive literature in the Midrashim about what uh, happened. So where do these, uh, um, where do these stories uh, come from? So again, they, they would be included in the same uh, discussion, except that there's an additional factor here. It's possible they were given actually, or, or predate even Sinai. It's possible they represent traditions which were handed down um, through the generations, not even from Sinai itself, but just part of the lived Jewish tradition. Um, a lot of these stories, by the way, are found in non-Chazal sources also. So they're found, for example, in uh, the writings of um, Philo, who lived uh, centuries before the editorship of the Mishnah, and, uh, and the, certainly before the Gemara, he lived in Alexandria um, in, in, uh, in temple times, really, in the times of the Beis HaMikdash. So where did he get these stories from? So it's possible he's reflecting oral traditions that were floating around Chazal, um, even though they were only recorded in our Masorah much later. Or it's possible these are traditions that were being said by the people also that remained part of the original um, in Samson of Al-Hash's language, the ancient folk tradition, as part of Jewish tradition, uh, in a sense, secular history. Um, what we know about what happened uh, a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago in uh, English history, if we know about uh, the Battle of Hastings or about uh, um, Alfred the Great or King Arthur, these aren't uh, um, Midrashim, these aren't from Chazal, these are secular folk history that's been trans transported through the generations, transmitted through the generations through tradition. So similarly, um, it's possible, I mean, uh, if, if you think about the era, the opening era of the second Mesa Mikdash, um, it wasn't that, that long after Matan Torah. It was, uh, you know, it was 1,300, 1,400 years after Matan Torah. It's quite feasible that this was part of a, uh, an oral tradition. So this is the first thing to say about Medrash. In a sense, what I've said so far is, in a sense, Medrash fits the same discussion as Alapa, but equally it's possible that some of the Medrashim reflect traditions that were outside the base of Medrash. They weren't from within the yeshiva, they weren't from within the Masora. They were just Medrashim that came from uh, beyond the Masora that were transmitted through Tolisol. So Hirsch argues. The second point to make about Medrash is that, of course, in general, one has to know um, to what degree it was, it was meant to be taken literally. To what degree a story being told to us is literal, and to what degree it's a metaphor. Maybe it's coming to make a deeper point, a point of theology or philosophy in uh, Yiddishkeit. Maybe it's possible to make, to, coming to make a Musa point, a point of uh, rebuke. In many Medrashim, as their name suggests, Medrash, they were part of a, a drosh or a, 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 a discourse given by a rabbinic leader, a bit like a drosha given in shul to this day. Many uh, Medrashim open the words, Dorash, Rabbi X. Rabbi so-and-so was Dorash in public, um, perhaps on a Shabbos, a certain Medrash, and it was taught to the, uh, to the people based on that. So uh, to what degree Medrash, uh, how Medrash is meant to be learned, and when it's meant to be taken literally, and when it's meant to be taken, uh, can call it allegorically or metaphorically, is a, again a subject in its own right. So in a sense, basically what I'm saying is in a sense, Medrash is also part of this conversation, but it also has uh, dynamics of its uh, own, which need to be understood. Um, which Medrash is meant to be taken literally? Which Medrash um, is meant to be taken uh, metaphorically, allegorically? Um, that's again, a subject of a uh, dispute. One would need to talk about that in its own right, about how to learn uh, Medrashim. But there's certain Medrashim where it definitely appears uh, clear that the Medrash is making a point. There's a very famous Medrash, for example, about Vashti growing a tail when she summons to Achishverosh. And that's a Medrash where, where it's easy to hear how this can be making a point that she's animalistic, a tail is a symbol of being animal-like. There's something very animalistic about her and the person she represents. So there are Medrashim where it would appear uh, um, almost intuitive or clear that the Medrash is meant to be taken um, allegorically. Um, I'll pause here, just if there's any questions, before we go on to look at uh, some of the chazals around this issue. Leonard, you posted something on, um, to me privately in the chat. I'm, I'm not sure what, what your point that you were trying to ask was. Maybe if you just want to say that balper uh, rather than uh, I'll, I'll be able to understand it. Yeah, that, no, there, there's a medrash saying that the Torah was there in existence even before the creation. So we're talking about things that have happened post-creation, but there are many medrashim that are, are talk about things that happened even before creation. So that was a medrash itself. That's the point I was just um, not... Okay, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I'll just mention two things. Um, the first is, you're right, I mean, this is a medrash itself, and to know how literally to take this medrash, what this medrash means, what it means by time, 
um, pre-creation uh, is itself uh, something that needs to be understood. Um, and the second point is that um, whatever the Medrash uh, means, it, it's on some level the Torah is referring to, it has to be some, some Torah which is higher or, or more the abstract principles than the actual Torah that we learn, because again, it's difficult to understand the Torah that we learn that would tell us stories about an Avera that Moshe made and uh, did, or, or sins that Paro did, or the others did, or whatever it may be, um, and make that consistent with the concept of uh, Chira as we have it. So, um, so this is an understanding of, of uh, Medrash, which, as I said, is really also connected to, uh, um, is really independent of the debate between Hash and others. Um, Anthony, I saw you posted, what's the point of the whole Talmud, which is the main argument if you go call Mitra of Hash. Um, according to this understanding of Hash, the maximalist position, the Talmud is a record of uh, the Masura. So the, the Talmud is vital in uh, being a written summary of, uh, of the Masura as it was. But indeed, the price you pay for the maximalist position is that Machlokas in the Talmud represents a forgetting of Torah um, rather than uh, an accurate transmission. So when you find Machlokas in the Gemara, um, it's because some of the Torah Shabal pair has been forgotten. Unlike in the minimist position, where Machlokas is, it comes from the fact that Chazal are deriving and generating Torah differently, which we'll, uh, we'll see in a few, uh, in a few moments. Um, how can we live with the Gemara so full of Machlokas? So this I addressed last week, and I, I point out that the Gemara is not so full of Machlokas. Gemara is fascinated by exploring the outer boundaries, the edges, and therefore it focuses on, on the extremes. But if you look in the middle, actually there's very little Machlokas around the middle. A normal sukkah, it's very clear what a normal sukkah looks like. You want to extend the sukkah up to crazy heights. Who makes a sukkah um, 40 feet uh, tall, 20 armors tall? Who makes a sukkah 10 to fachim tall, uh, lower, you know, as low as a table? So the, uh, the Gemara deals with extremes, but the, the norm in a Gemara, um, the norm of what a mitzvah is, that's not machlokas. So even though when we learn Gemara, we're pushing things to the boundaries because we want to understand the parameters, the borders, the delineation of halacha, nonetheless, the majority of Mishnah and Gemara is a transmission of Masora, which uh, remains preserved in a remarkably uh, accurate manner. So this is the, uh, this is the, these are the two perspectives. Now, um, what we're going to see in the next part of the shir is I'm going to look at some of the Marmari Chazal, which can be read with a maximalist position or a minimalist position. I'll then mention very briefly some of the classic sources that adopt a maximalist position, like Hirsch, and then we will explore in more detail the minimalist position um, and see what it says. And hopefully we'll manage to uh, get through a chunk of that at least uh, um, still today. So um, maybe just looking at some of the Mamari Chazal, I'll, I'll mention uh, some of those which are, are well known and, and classic on the topic. Um, uh, let me just think which ones to start with. Um, I'll, I'll mention maybe three Chazal in the time that we have available. Um, and these are really ones that, that uh, their language has become part of everyday discourse. Um, there's a Gemara in Erevin, Dafyud Gimel on the base, a very uh, famous Gemara. Omar of Abba, Omar Shmuel, of Abba says in the name of Shmuel, Shalosh Shonim Nechluchu Beis Shammai Beis Hillel. Um, three years, the Beis Shammai Beis Hillel, the Yeshiva of Hillel and the Yeshiva of Shammai, Shammai, the Beis Medrash of them, argue over a particular matter. Um, each one maintains its view. Yotza Baskel Omra, Eilu Ve'elu Divir Him Chaim. A voice from heaven, a Baskel, a heavenly voice, came out and said, Eilu ve'elu divrei elokim chaim, these and these are the words of the living God. Meaning that somehow or other, both opinions represent a truth. Um, not clear and easy to understand in the maximalist position, which seems to argue that one got it right and one got it wrong because only one or the other was what was transmitted in, um, in, uh, in the Masura. The Gemara, by the way, carries on with the less famous continuation. These and these are the words of the living God, Eilu ve'edu divirikim chaim, v'halachok be'isilol, but nonetheless, the halach is like be'isilol. In other words, it's very nice opening up all the possibilities and saying that somehow both stances represent a truth. Nonetheless, um, one has to paskin. So how, how is one going to paskin? Halachok be'isilol. Why is the halacha like be'isilol? Well, the Gemara carries on, since both stances represent the words of the living God, why is the halacha like Beisilo? Well, it's a fascinating, very difficult answer. They were easy and they were 
um, uh, generous or kindly. They used to learn their own view and the view of Beis Shammai. So if you walked into the Beis Hamedrash of Beis Hillel, you would A, meet people who are noichim v'alovim somehow. They were easier uh, to get on with. And in addition, they would teach in their yeshiva both viewpoints. As opposed to if you walked into the yeshiva of Shammai, there you would only um, hear the viewpoint of Beis Shammai. Secondly, more than that, they would put Beis Shammai's view ahead of their own view. So if you went into their yeshiva, they would first learn the view of Beis Shammai, then they would learn the view of Beis Hillel. And by the way, this tradition has been maintained through Mishnah. So whenever you learn Mishnah, you'll always see the view of Beis Shammai edited by Rabbi Huda Nasi, put pre or first before the view of Beis Hillel. Rabbi Huda Nasi, incidentally, of course, is a descendant of Hillel. Nonetheless, he, when he edited the Mishnahis, he preserved the traditional format in the way they were taught in which Beis Hillel's view came first. Now, this is a fascinating source. I mean, it's nice, and it's, you know, it's nice, a moral sentiment that Beis Hillel um, somehow are nice and easier people than Beis Shammai, and therefore the halacha is like them. But what, why should halacha be determined by midas? Why should halacha be determined by character traits? Surely the correct determinant should be which one is correct. So this is a separate topic, one that will address um, these gods in a future series when we look at the idea of psak halacha. If it's true that Eidu ve'edu divide kim chayim, that both represent the living god, a, uh, a version of, uh, um, of truth somehow, then why should it be that the halacha is like one, not like the other? Okay, this is one very classic source on the topic. Um, a second uh, classic uh, source on the topic is a Gemara in Baba Metzia. Um, Gemara in Baba Metzia describes they were arguing in the yeshiva of, um, of heaven. Um, we know the, the words, the heavenly academy, it's maybe something that you've uh, heard before that's used around the term, the heavenly academy, the, the yeshiva shalmala. There's another term which is used, which is based in shalmala, the heavenly court. Now, based in shalmala, I understand. Unfortunately, or fortunately, for better or for worse, we are judged on high. But uh, Yeshiva Shalmala is an interesting terminology. There's an academy on high in which they learn uh, Torah. Now, again, this is a medrash, so we have to understand what medrashim are doing. Um, presumably, on some level, this is metaphorical. Presumably, it's telling us they, they learn uh, spiritual and godly insights. A soul in heaven achieves spiritual and godly insights, theological insights, awareness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and morality and spirituality. Part of that is the continued conscious experience post-death. We discussed Onam Abba in our uh, previous series. But the Gemara uses the language of Masifta uh, Durakiya, the Masifta, the Yeshiva, the Academy of Heaven. And the Gemara fascinatingly brings a story in which, um, um, in which uh, the based in the Yeshiva Shamal, I'm sorry, are arguing over a particular halachic matter, and they leave the issue unresolved. And they say that when Rabba Banachmeni dies, he's a particular expert on this topic, and he'll, uh, he'll resolve the matter for us. He will teach the matter, um, he will teach the matter to us. So this is a, uh, um, a Gemara which seems to indicate that even in the based in Shalmala, even, sorry, in the Yeshiva Shalmala, there's debate around issues, and the Yeshiva Shalmala needs to wait for the resolution of the matter until um, uh, um, a, a human being, a human thinker, ascends on high post-death and is able to resolve the issue. So again, this is indicating that somehow it's in human hands, the resolution of a, uh, a topic, which leads us to um, the, the final source that maybe I'll share, although uh, maybe I'll share one more after that, the, the very famous um, Gemara also in Baba Metzia of the story of Tanur um, Shal Achanoi. Um, there was a, an oven, I'm not going to go into the details of Machlokas, an oven um, which, about which there was a debate about its status of Tumma and Tara, and this ended up as being a, a, a terrible debate, a, a raging, fierce debate between Rabbi Leza and the rest of the Chachomim in the Beis HaMedrash. And Rabbi Leza um, uh, responded, and the Chachomim responded, and the debate raged backwards and forwards, and they couldn't reach resolution, till um, Rabbi Leza said, Im kmosi, If the halacha is like me, the carob tree should prove who's right, and the carob tree was uprooted and jumped 100 amas or other versions say 400 amas, to which the sages in the base of Medrash responded, you can't bring a proof from a carob tree. He then said, let the river 
the stream proved like me, and the stream began flowing backwards rather than forwards. And again, they said you can't prove anything from a stream of water. Can't pass an is based on streams of water. Then he said the walls of the base measure should prove like me. And the walls began tilting in as if they were going to fall. So Rabbi Yeshua screamed at the walls, what are you doing? If the sages are arguing, who asked you to interfere in the, um, in the debate? And the walls remained at an angle. They didn't straighten up in honor of Rabbi Lezer. They didn't continue falling in honor of Rabbi Yeshua. And therefore they remained at an alach zone, an, anger, an angle. Then Rabbi Lezer said, um, okay, let uh, God himself uh, prove uh, the answer. Min from the heavens they should prove. A heavenly voice came out and said, why are you arguing with Rabbi Lezer? Why are you arguing with Rabbi Lezer? The halach is always like him. So Rabbi Yeshua again stood up and said, the heavens, um, Torah is not found in the heavens. Torah has been given, Torah has already been given to, on Sinai. We don't listen to a baskol. So again, how to learn this medrash and to what degree it's meant to be literally understood, a separate topic. Um, all the Mepharshim understand whether you take the Medrash literally or not, that it's also symbolically. And some argument that Rabbi Eleazar is bringing from a carob tree, from organic life and trees that are growing, from rivers which are flowing, from the walls of the base of Medrash, but finally he appeals to heaven. And the answer is no, Torah is not in heaven. Meaning to say maybe in Shemayim there's some form of absolute truth, but we human beings, we're here down on earth and we don't get this absolute truth. We have to be the ones that rule on Torah. We have been given the Torah, Lo here. Once the Torah has been given from Sinai, we need to pasken it. So again, doesn't sound like this Hershian model of um, a transmission of Torah. It sounds like there's a genuine machlokus, a full and complete machlokus uh, going on over here. And again, the story has a continuation, which is fascinating. What was Hashem doing at that uh, time? How did he react to the fact that he was being uh, overruled by, uh, by the heavenly, uh, by the, the earthly sages? Omelis, Elio, who has insight into what goes on in the heavenly academy, answers, Kachayach, Hashem was smiling, Va'ama, Nitzchuni Bonai Nitzchuni, my sons, my children have beaten me. They have been victorious um, over me. In other words, Hakad Shrochu approves in some way of the Nitzachon, of the victory, of his children, of the sages, over his own um, Shomayim, heavenly uh, perspective. Um, maybe I'll just mention one final source, which is a Medrash Tanchuma, which also brings out this point uh, um, very clearly. Um, and, and that's two, maybe two more Medrash I, I need to mention over here. Uh, one is the Medrash Tanchuma, which says that when Rabbi Lezer, when, when Hashem argues, how does Hashem, sorry, when Hashem learns, how does Hashem learn? What uh, version of uh, Torah does Hashem learn? Does he learn like uh, one sage or like another sage? And the Gemara says that he learns quoting the different, uh, the different sages. He learns quoting the different opinions. So when he learns, he says, my son Rabbi Lezer says this, my son Rabbi Yeshua says this, my son Akiva Bani says this, Yishmael Bani says this. He learns quoting each of the Tanaitic opinions um, that, uh, that, uh, that followed. So these are all Midrashim, which seem to indicate a, a view that somehow there isn't an absolute truth, but that the Torah itself contains within it these vantage points. And even HaKadosh Baruch Hu is happy to learn the Torah based upon a particular human vantage point. When there's a debate in the, um, based in, in the Yeshiva Shomala, it's possible that HaKadosh Baruch Hu adopts one stance, the heavenly bodies adopt another stance, and they say that human beings uh, decide. In others, there may be some sort of absolute truth, but this absolute truth isn't completely accessible. The malachim or the heavenly forces hear something else. They're debating amongst themselves, different slants, different angles, and the human beings are the ones who have been given the role of deciding. So these are, are all indicating that machlokas uh, somehow demonstrates a genuine, uh, um, a genuine, uh, point of disagreement and a legitimacy to genuine human innovation and insight into determining um, what the facts of the matter are, what the Torah truth in a situation is. Now, um, there's one more famous Gemara, maybe, which I'll mention in this light, which is the story of Moshe being given the Torah. 
And uh, um, uh, the story goes as follows. It's a Gemara again in Menachos, Kafes on Beis. I can't stress enough, by the way, how, how common a theme this is in Medrash. And again, we're not learning Medrash in this series. We'll, in, maybe in another series, we'll look at how Medrash is meant to be learned. But this is a theme that's endemic in Chazal. I mean, it's, it's so central to Chazal's thinking. We, we don't have systematic um, philosophy or theology from Chazal. And the sages didn't teach uh, philosophy or theology in, in the same way as it was later adopted by the Ge'onim and the Rambam under Greek uh, influence of sort of systematic, uh, organized Tashkafa. But they, in, they taught it through, through metaphor, through stories, through, through uh, literature, through uh, Medrash. And uh, one of the major topics of Medrash, there's no doubt, is about the significance of Torah. Because I saw Torah as very central to spirituality. And uh, they taught the significance in, in this very human orientated term. And therefore, I'm, I'm simply quoting Gomorrahs, but there's so many Gomorrahs around these themes um, that take the stance. And I, I'm just doing this. I, I think these Gomorrahs have become very famous. I'm simply trying to do this in a sense as Chazara. Um, and I'll mention here one more Gemara in this context, which is the Gemara in Menachas, in which the Gemara says, Kasha'ala Moshe Lamorim, when Moshe ascended on side, on high, on high, and that was at the time of Matan Torah, Motzala Kodesh Baruch Hu Yoshe for Kosha Kasorim Laosius. He found God tying the crowns onto the letters. Now again, this is clearly metaphor. God doesn't have a body. He's not sitting. He doesn't tie crowns onto letters. But we know that the crowns in the Sefer Torah have, le- have sorry, the letters in the Sefer Torah have crowns. And Moshe Rabbein was interested, what is the nature of these crowns? Um, says uh, Moshe to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what's the purpose of these crowns? What are they for? Hashem answers him, um, echod yesh, there's a person there who in the future will be, She'osid liyos b'sof kamadoros, who will be after many generations, Vakiva ben Yosef Shemo, Rabbi Kiva is his name, She'osid lidrosh kol koit v'koit. He's going to interpret every crown, tinin tinin shal halachas, and each crown is going to learn heaps of halachas. In other words, Rabbi Kiva, who is um, in Midrashic literature, always described the role or the parallel role to Moshe. He is the Moshe of Torah Shabal Peh. Um, Rabbi Kiva will be Doresh, he will derive heaps of halachas from every nuance of text in the Torah. Rabbi Kiva, historically, by the way, is one of the main roots, main avenues of Torah Shabal Peh. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole history now, it's perhaps a share for Sfirah Sa'omer, but we know that Rabbi Kiva's uh, Talmidim died in Sfirah Sa'omer. We mourn that because this was a loss of the, in a sense, of a very significant transmission of Torah. Rabbi Kiva then taught the Rabbi Seinish of Badorim, the sages of the South, five Rabbonim, who become the, really the teachers of Torah in, in every Mishnah that we learn almost. I should mention that Torah Shabalpeh, the body of Torah Shabalpeh, if you look at Mishnah and Gomorrah together, there's maybe more than 2,000 names mentioned. So we're talking about, and, and the span of Torah Shabalpeh is about 1,000 years. So, sorry, the span of Mishnah and Gomorrah is about 1,000 years of collections of sayings and so on. Um, nonetheless, Rabbi Kiva takes a very central role in this. And he is Dorish. He has a unique ability to derive halacha from subtleties of text and even just the crowns on the letter. So Moshe responds to Hashem. Um, Hareulo, let me see him. Hareuli, let me see him. I'm interested to see him. Omelo Chazol Acherecha, step back. Halach the Yosha so Shmon Ashuras. Moshe sat um, eight rows back from the front of the base medrash in Rabbi Kiva's base medrash. So again, we don't know exactly what this means, but somehow Moshe has an experience in which he sees himself seated in the base medrash of Rabbi Kiva, and he's not a front bencher. He's eight rows back. He didn't understand the sheer. Toshash Kochis, so he felt um, weak. He felt that uh, somehow, uh, well, what's going on over here? I'm not understanding my own Torah. Um, in the end, this Yashvadata, he calmed down because he heard them saying, the students asked Rabbi Kiva, where do you draw these halachas from? These are all halacha and Moshe Misinai. So what the Medrash seems to be telling us is that we can have our balance over here. We can have both halves. We can have something which is a chiddush of Rabbi Kiva, is an invasion of Rabbi Kiva, derived from the nuances of the crowns of the letters that even Moshe Rabbeinu himself doesn't know. And yet somehow this is true to Halach and Moshe Messina. This is all true to what Moshe was teaching from Sinai. And Moshe sees how this is somehow a direct continuation of that which he uh, taught. Um, it's always dangerous giving modern day analogies to Medrashim, and uh, especially when we're talking about the status of Moshe Rabbeinu. But I, I don't think it's outlandish to suggest if Moshe attended a, a medical ethics share in the 21st century, or share about um, microcircuitry in halacha, or share about um, 
uh, cloning and halacha or something of the sort, we could perhaps apply on some level a similar sort of analogy in which we could say, on the one hand, everything we're saying is halacha and Moshe Sinai. It's all true to authoritative Torah. And on the other hand, on some level, Moshe wouldn't understand what we were saying because it's an application of Torah to a new uh, scenario. I'm not suggesting this is what the Medrash means. The Medrash seems to be talking about within Torah itself, but perhaps it's an a- analogy of how there can be a growth of Torah Shval Peh um, in a manner in which Moshe himself um, won't be able to um, understand. Um, so these are all Medrashim which seem to indicate the sort of spread of Torah beyond how uh, they are transmitted from Moshe. And I stress all of these because we, we often um, don't sort of put these two Medrashim together in our minds, all these Medrashim together in our minds. Um, most of us are familiar with some or all of these Medrashim. They're very well-known examples and um, that perhaps we've heard countless times on Shavuos, of Loba Shemaim here, how the Torah is given to us human beings. And yet on the other hand, we continue to teach our kids in school, um, what is Torah Shemal Peh? And we, we ourselves say this, what is Torah Shemal Peh? It's the oral tradition handed down from Moshe to Sinai. Now these Medrashim are, are in conflict with that definition of Torah Shemal Peh. There, there, are, there are two definitions floating around Torah Shemal Peh, or many, but two poles that you can adopt. Um, you have a pole in which everything is part of the oral tradition handed down to Moshe, or you have a pole in which there's a lot of human creativity and generation of Torah through the application of Torah to uh, new situations, certainly, but more than that, even to deriving halacha itself through our uh, use of human reason. And therefore, we should be conscious when we define Torah Shemal Peh, maybe as an educative tool when we're teaching kids and so on, it's correct to define in that manner, that's a separate discussion. Maybe it's right to adopt a particular stance just to simplify the issue. And certainly for us, as we're trying to understand in a more nuanced way, we shouldn't suffice just with the definition of Torah Shemal Peh as being that which is um, orally transmitted once we've seen all these uh, Medrashim. Now, um, it is true that there are Medrashim which suggest the opposite also. And maybe I'll just cite uh, one, given that our time is a little limited today, which is a Rashi at the beginning of uh, Parshas Bahar. Rashi at the beginning of the Sedra of um, Bahar tells us, um, uh, uh, the opening postdoc of Bahar says um, that these are the halachas of Shemitah, which were given Bahar Sinai, they were given at Har Sinai, to which Rashi quotes Chazal as asking, um, why is Shemitah particularly located as being given at Har Sinai? Surely the whole Torah was given at uh, Har Sinai. And on that answers Rashi, it's to tell us that just like um, Shemitah, Kloloseo, Pratiseo, Dikta Seo, every detail was given in, um, in Shemitah was given at Sinai, so too we should know that every detail of the Torah, Kloloseo, Pratiseo, Dikta Seo, were all given at uh, Sinai. There's a Gemara in Megillah, your tests, on Rav Chia Ba'aba, on Rav Yochanan, which says the same thing. Herea Kodesh Rorach in Moshe, Hashem showed Moshe, Diktuke Torah ve Diktuke Sofrim, or Masha Sofrim Asidim Nachadish. Everything that the sages were destined to uh, innovate, all of that was shown to Moshe, says Rashi. Um, Diktuke Sofrim, the, the sages' innovation, Shadiktuke Acharonim, Mimishnas Roshonim, even the details of the later sages, the Amorim, perhaps we would say, who are Medayik, who derives um, halachas from the language of the earlier authorities, even that was given to Moshe on Sinai. Um, in fact, the Gemara carries on and says, Masha Sofrim Asidim Neschadesh, even that which the sages are going to innovate, or my Nihu Mikra Megillah. What is this? This is the reading of the Megillah on. Um, on Purim. So here we have a mitzvah, which is explicitly later, explicitly linked to an event that takes place a thousand, three hundred years after Matan Torah, and yet um, in the Gemara and Megillah, it somehow links this back to Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, it sounds like harsh that Moshe taught everything at Sinai, and there's no real chiddush, no real um, innovation at all. And it's even the Megillah, which is Rabbanon. Now the truth is, the Medrash doesn't quite say that. The Medrash says, that Hera Hashem Moshe. Hashem showed Moshe this. It doesn't say exactly that he taught it, meaning to say that maybe it was shown in some sort of vision, like Moshe had a vision of Rabbi Kiva um, teaching Torah. It doesn't mean that he was taught it, maybe it was just shown to him in the general uh, principles. Also, it doesn't say clearly in the Medrash that Moshe handed this down to the later generations. It simply said Moshe was taught it. Whether this became part of the corpus of the oral tradition 
again, the Medrash doesn't make a claim about that. Um, we're running out of time because I, I, I give that like in my Gemara share at 10 o'clock. So I'm going to finish now simply by saying that in Chazal, therefore, we have a range of sources, many sources which seem to indicate that um, there is later innovation, but equally sources which do seem to say that uh, Moshe was given everything, but whether these are ironclad sources or not uh, is not so clear cut. And it may be this is a subject of debate amongst Chazal themselves. What we will see when we resume the Shir is that this is certainly a debate amongst the Ga'onim and Rishonim. And we'll look at that, um, please God, uh, um, in Elul in September when we restart again. Um, so in the meantime, I wish you all uh, um, well. I hope uh, you have a, a good summer break. I see, notice um, David and Ruth here. So I wish you Mazel Tov also. I can see from your backgrounds, you're watching from Israel. Um, mazel Tov on the upcoming uh, wedding also. And uh, nice to see you joining from afar. And uh, I wish everyone uh, to be well and uh, have a good week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.